السلام عليكم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I'll tell you honestly right up front I've never ever been so scared of saying the wrong things as I am with this session so I hope you pay close attention and you stay with us inshallah I'm so happy that you have joined us for this live session we will um, try to keep it live as much as possible we will take some questions throughout the presentation presentation is long unfortunately i couldn't keep it uh, shorter than it will come out but there is a load of information there's a huge ton of information inshallah you will benefit from it those of you who are with us uh, live please maintain maintain the proper decorum on the chat uh, as much as possible, try to reduce the side chatting and focus on the topics. They're heavy. I promise you, you have a lot coming your way. So without any further ado, we're going to jump directly into the material. This is YT172. Uh, we, are, uh, we are on the third part of the story of Suleiman. Again, we're going to talk about the woman who exposed her legs. Uh, specifically, we're going to jump into the mauj. And the mauj, as we've defined it in the past uh, segment, YT171, uh, we, have, uh, we, have, we have defined the word mauj, and we're going to see it with our own eyes. It's basically what in English would be double speak. It is a speech that is meant to deceive Certain people hear it, understand one way. Other groups of people hear it and they understand something more insightful, more treacherous. And this is what the Quran refers to as treacherous or treachery. We have seen this in the story of Yusuf. In the story of Yusuf, the woman, Imra'at al-Aziz, the, the subordinate woman of the reverent one, the king, when she heard about their treachery, Quran is defining their words as treachery. And she understood exactly that the rumor has circulated enough. So this is the concept of makr. Makr is defined very clearly in the story of Yusuf. We've talked about it. We're going to see the makr. And we're going to see Allah referring to her words as makr. Not just her words, but the words of people who are under her influence. So as I said, I've never been as scared as I am right now of saying the wrong things because there is so much treachery in her words and in the words of others. Inshallah, in the future parts of the same series about Sulaiman, you're going to learn. You're going to learn about who else was under her influence among the big names, among the big names of the Quran. I know some of you are finding this hard to accept, to swallow. I know some of you are finding it hard to understand. Why would Allah be teaching us? about a group of messengers, messengers, messengers or prophets who actually fell into her trap. And the answer is because Allah wants us to be aware. So it's part of the training for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, in future segments in this series, we're going to see. We're going to see how Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala gave him direct instructions, direct uh, knowledge so that he doesn't fall trap into this. Where else would Muhammad learn if not from the Qur'an? Remember, in the Qur'an, nothing is left out. Allah did not forget to include anything, including how to train us as he trained our beloved, وسلم, not to fall prey to such treachery, to such double speak. We're going to see, inshallah. And we're going to have new evidence from the Qur'an revealed for the first time in this manner, based on this understanding, that the corruption of the divine lexicon, the Quranic terminology, the understanding of the divine lexicon, not necessarily, definitely not the corruption of the Quran, alhamdulillah, the corruption of understanding the terminology started during the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're going to see it with our own eyes in Surah an naml And in the future, I'll give you additional proofs and evidence. We've talked about this several times before, but now we see it directly related to a story. And then you understand that this story, the story of Suleiman in Surah An-Naml, is not about some queen in some distant land that had some interactions with a prophet 
and then she exposed her legs and you know a sexy story that that's how they understood in the books of tafsir allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a much more insightful much more dangerous revelation exposure of of, of facts that affected the life and the mission of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and by extension that story should affect our life and our mission those of you who have uh, followed the prior two segments have heard me say in the last segment last week that i had no choice but to come out and expose her story and you're going to see hopefully you will get the hint and you will see for yourself why that is the case in this segment we're going to start with a significant warning a serious warning and some advance notice regarding future segments also we're going to arm ourselves some of you heard me say i have my own self defense mechanisms the dua from allah is our self defense we have no better defense we have no better supporter than allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allah supports us as he promised us so we're going to start with those two special dua and we're going to close with them we're going to close with them as part of the good news last week i promised you that there is a lot of good news in this story again we're going to hit on this subject and we're going to close the segment or this presentation with the good news inshallah so the more important part or the the significant central part of this presentation is the mauj the exact composition of the mauj and we're going to dissect it we're going to put her words on the dissection table and dissect it to death until it is absolutely clear what she is trying to say versus what appears to be like she's saying so unfortunately all the books of tafsir took the apparent surface zina layer and that's what they went with and understood the story um at the level of of zina and yet we're going to see in this part in this segment how she meant something totally different and how jibril put specific instructions for us in the quran it's a fascinating paragraph we're going to visit from uh, surah 27 we're going to ask again just to kind of reinforce what did she do that was so bad and we're going to list it and you you get to understand how it reflects on your own uh, life learnings around you from from people around you and so on we're going to dive a little bit more into ayah 1144 if you remember last week we visited the paragraph from surah hud that literally exposed first hand you know direct relevance uh, direct evidence from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching us how she operates and the effect on the son of nuh and how she took control over al judi if you don't know what i'm talking about that means you don't belong watching the segment go back please kindly for your own good watch 170 and 1171 and then you can come back it's not going anywhere anywhere inshallah it will be on youtube for you to watch later we're going to have a surprise disclosure regarding women in general you're going to be amazed and we're going to share some details about a narration that has been so misunderstood and so grossly unfair uh, in its understanding and their explanation it's been unfair to women according to how they explained it we're going to see how it fits with the story and that narration will illuminate and will prove to us how muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was definitely using the right abrahamic locution as he spoke with his companions and his uh, his even his enemies and then we're going to go into an unprecedented disclosure as i said direct evidence that the corruption started during the life of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam but alhamdulillah the quran was never corrupted the understanding of the quran all over the place and that's why we keep referring to the last 1400 years as the dark ages some of you don't believe me when i say 1400 years in the future segment i'm going to share with you where it points to us and says you're going to have 40 years it's talking to muhammad and his community you're going to have 40 specific 40 years and then after that you're going to have a dark age the, the quran is telling us this i'm not making it up and you're going to see it for yourself again we're going to close with some sad news from surah 27 and then we're going to see the great hope 
the great tidings, the glad tidings that I've talked to you about last week. We'll get started, inshallah. Reminders, please watch YT-170 and YT-171. Make sure that you are not getting into this segment before you have been acquainted and really understood 170 and 171. Please don't comment. Don't criticize what you don't understand. Go back to 170 and 171 so that you can understand the background that we have laid uh, before we got into this 172, uh, this segment right here. Forget everything you were taught about this story, the Quranic story about Sulaiman in Surah 27 bears no resemblance whatsoever to what the claims, to, to what the books of Tafsir claimed uh, for that story to be about. The story will not be completed today, that's for sure, because as I said, we're going to continue into future segments. Some of the evidence will be continuing to develop and to be presented for your benefit one segment at a time. Frankly, I have no idea when we will close this series, and I will not be surprised if we keep unfolding and the Hur keep unraveling all the way past the end of Ramadan, meaning a month and a half, two months from now. So don't be surprised if we keep going with this series for a long time because it removes a layer of confusion from the Quran that has been so deep and has been plagued with such decrepit understanding. We have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of scraping to do to remove the erroneous understanding and interpretations in the books of Tafsir. We have a lot of work to do. So I'm not sure how many segments we will keep going, to be honest with you. Because every time I put my finger on anything, it just explodes. It's like a geyser. It's waiting for someone to poke it, and then it just explodes. All sorts of new knowledge, all sorts of new understanding. So if you're not familiar with how we engage the Quran, please don't start with this one. This is definitely very advanced, you know, master's level or graduate school level type of course. If you're not even past the high school, in your understanding of the organic Quranic methodology, please don't start here. This is not good for you. This is going to hurt you. This is going to make you uncomfortable. And this is going to cause a lot more confusion in your life than you are ready to handle. So please watch the other videos on this channel starting from the earliest. Earliest, if you can go to YT01, that's good for you. And they're there. They're not going to go anywhere, inshallah. You will keep watching them one at a time. And I promise you, it's, it's going to be for your own benefit. If you don't do anything else, make sure you watch YT93. YT93 is a seminal landmark segment that you cannot afford to be watching anything on this channel without watching it. All right, the warning. I promised you there's going to be a significant warning. And here it is. Make sure you are ready. Make sure you take notes, of course. <clears throat> but we're going to talk about the duplicitous doublespeak. What is duplicitous? It's almost the same thing as doublespeak. I'm including both words because I want to make sure no one misses what, what I'm saying. Duplicitous, that means uh, it's a type of speech that could be interpreted in multiple ways, or at least two ways. One of them is good. One of them is sneaky and, and sort of naughty, or not naughty in the sense of, of uh, you know, morality-wise, but naughty in the sense of meaning something totally different. For those who are not paying attention, they will pass by that speech and they will not get the dangerous under, underlying uh, stream of treachery that's going on with that speech. That's duplicitous. Double speak means exactly the same thing, but a little bit more advanced in the sense that it uses code words. And those code words are understood by one group of people without understanding these code words. Another group of people may think totally different of that speech, of that, of that type of uh, speech. So this is duplicitous double speak. We're going to talk about this again and again as we keep going with the future segments. And as I said, you're going to hear other prophets and messengers fall into the trap of using that double speak. And thus, Allah reveals to us a lot more truth about them, a lot more insights and real advanced proofs of the things that we have told you about so far in the channel. I think you know what I'm talking about, but we'll keep it until a future segment. So the double speak that's disclosed in this segment, please pay attention. This is not a joke. This will shake you to the core. 
you're going to ask all sorts of questions and you're going to be left wondering, have we really understood anything? This segment is not for the weak or uninitiated in the Abrahamic locution because we build on our knowledge of the Abrahamic locution that we've developed in 171 segments before this one to really dissect and understand what's going on with the double speak of the woman. Please don't underestimate the effect of this knowledge, including its potential effect against you, against you, yes, I mean what I say, against you. Everyone watching should take the time after the video ends to reflect, to think, and to consider the effect of this type of speak, this type of duplicitous speech, double speak, the effect of it on ourselves and our past, and on those around us still today. So as I told you, this will shake you to the core. This will create a wave of uncertainty. But alhamdulillah, we have the defense mechanisms. We're going to start with them in just a few minutes. And we're going to close with them. And you'll see how Allah did not leave us without making sure that the road is well lit ahead, of, ahead for us. This knowledge of the duplicitous double speak will eliminate several other stories, Quranic stories about prophets. Yes, about prophets, about messengers. Perhaps you will see and will provide additional insights and proofs regarding the story specifically of the famous Qari. But be patient. Ain't going to happen today. It's not going to happen because we have already so much material waiting for us. We will continue with the story of Sulaiman with several segments, but not necessarily in a contiguous sequence. As I said, it's going to be a long series. I'm not sure how long. 5, 10, 20 segments, to be honest with you. I have no clue right now. It is unfolding as we speak. And inshallah, we will not leave it until we're totally, totally done. We want to put this story to bed and make sure this ilm is, uh, left, is left available for those who really seek it. So we will start with a special dua just for our own defense. When I finish the dua, take just a few seconds and read it, recite it, and understand it. And inshallah, you will, you will be in, in, uh, in the right mode to understand the rest of this presentation. This dua is based on this ayah, ayah 1427. Yuthabbitullahu amanu Allah is the one who provides steadiness with the correct criteria. Remember, you thabbitu, there's a shadda in here. There's a shadda. Shadda means there is some criteria given. There's some understanding given. There's some clarity in our mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is promising. He will give those who believed. Why those who believed not al-mu'minun? You will see. Bilqawli thabiti fil hayati dunya With with um, those who believed with the steady speech or in the steady speech, they believe in the steady speech. So they believe there is truth in the speech of the Quran. They believe in it. So it's not those who believed in the past as we've seen it before. And Allah give them steadiness with this steady speech. So this is in and with at the same time. <clears throat> in the lower life and according to the delayed, diligent understanding. What does that mean? That means thabiti have to work on الأخرة, the delayed, diligent understanding. They can't just be reading as if they're reading a story or a novel. They have to work. They have to do the toiling that we keep talking about. And what else? And Allah misguides the transgressors. The transgressors with the Quran, we've seen this before. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala misguides using the Quran, whomever he chooses, he wills, or whomever, whoever chooses to be guided. And he guides those uh, who are seeking to be guided. Rabbi Thabitni, this is the dua that we build. And again, if you are a member, a subscriber on our website, you constantly, every day, alhamdulillah, you receive a new dua uh, or a dua based on the Abrahamic locution. This is an example. So this ayah right here is using the terminology we learn from this ayah in order to craft, yasna, to craft 
a dua using the Abrahamic locution. The dua is Rabbi, Rabbi, my Lord, Thabitni, Thabitni. We're going to see the meaning in detail. بالقول الثابت في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة وجنبني ضلال الظالمين. I put the transliteration in here for those of you who cannot read Arabic directly. So please take just a second, recite it. رب ثبتني بالقول الثابت في الحياة الدنيا وفي الآخرة وجنبني ضلال الظالمين. This is the terminology that we got from this ayah. So we take the terminology and we craft it. We make it work for our benefit. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is expecting us to do shukur, to communicate with him. You understood what I told you. Great. Use it to make dua. I will listen. I will dignify your dua. And your Lord said, invite me, supplicate to me. I shall respond. This is his promise. This is what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And to Allah belongs <laughs> the insightful labels. Al-Asma is not a name. Allah does not have multiple names. Allah does not even need a name. The labels, the labels of the Quran, the labels of the divine terminology are insightful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, to him belong all of these labels. Use them to make dua. Use them to make dua. This is what we do. This is the special gift that those who are subscribed on the website receive every day. Alhamdulillah. So I hope you join us and you become part of the community of supporters on our website. The translation, my Lord, grant me steadiness with the correct criteria. Remember, there's a shadda on the ba, meaning there's some correct criteria, understanding, justification. It's not just fluff. It's not just poof and Allah grants it to you whether you, or not you have done the work and the toiling for it. No. Thabitni, that means you have reached the correct criteria and understanding and you've toiled and Allah will grant you to give you that steadiness. Using the steady speech, which is clarified with the correct criteria as we just did in the lower life and according to the delayed diligent understanding. And steer me away, wajannibni, wajannibni, you know, make me safe from, or, you know, steer me away from the misguidance of the transgressors. So one more time. Rabbi thabitni bil qawli thabiti fil hayati dunya wa fil akhirati wajannibni dalal al-dhalimeen inna ka samiyun alim. We have a second dua for you. Second dua is based directly on the story of Nuh. How amazing is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us the origin of this problem we're dealing with, which is the woman, the ajuz fil ghabirin, that imra'at anuh that we talked about in 171 and we gave hints about in earlier videos. Imra'at anuh is in the story of Nuh and Allah gave us the answer, the defense mechanism in the story of Nuh. How beautiful is this? How, how touching and, and fair fair from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do this. If you don't find it in the story of Nuh, you should have a question mark. But it is. Alhamdulillah. So this is embedded. Please pay, to, pay attention to my word. This, these, these three ayat are embedded in the story of Nuh. But listen to them and you're going to find that they're not necessarily talking only about Nuh. They're talking about everyone who is following in the way of Nuh, who yasna'ul fulk, he crafts he crafts the dua. The ayat go, فَدَعَى رَبَّهُ أَنِّي مَغْلُوبٌ فَانْتَصِرْ فَفَتَحْنَا أَبْوَابَ السَّمَاءِ بِمَاءٍ مُنْهَمِرْ وَفَجَّرْنَا الْأَرْضَ عُيُونًا فَالْتَقَى الْمَاءُ عَلَىٰ أَمْرٍ قَدْ قُدِرْ Here's the translation based on the Abrahamic locution. Please don't argue with me if you don't understand this translation. That means you're not following the methodology that we extracted from the Quran. We're not making things up. We have to align all of the things we've learned and all the principles of the methodology and the terminology in order to understand. It's not so strange. And he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, does not tell us who because this ayah is separated. Yes, it is in the middle of the story of Nuh, but it's separated. Think. It's a big hint. فَدَعَى رَبَّهُ He supplicated to his Lord or he invited his Lord. 
They're the same thing. When you supplicate using the terminology of someone, you're inviting that someone. When you supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by definition, you use the terminology he granted you, he gave you, he gifted you. Knowing, so he says, he supplicated to his Lord, knowing that I, what do you mean I? There should be a quotation mark in verse, in verse uh, quotes. No, I'm leaving it in here because any, the speaker is mentioning this. Ah, the narrator is saying this? Yes, Jibreel, of course. Pay attention. That I am overcome. I am overcome. Maghloub, I am overcome. By the rejectors, of course. And we were taught about this in the Quran all over the place. They rejected him. They keep rejecting him. All of those who claim to be his followers don't have a clue whether or not they have the original scripture or not. And don't believe those channels who are telling you the original scripture is here. No, the original scripture by definition in the Quran is clearly described as having been lost. And Allah challenges them. Bring me, bring me bring me a single scripture before this one, before the Quran. Or even a trace of knowledge. And yet you have some channels who are blabbering their mouth, trying to prove that the gospel of John is correct, that the Torah is correct. They're liars, they're deceivers, they're really misrepresenting the Quran under the auspice of trying to defend the Quran. And you'll see, double speak, double speak. The Quran will teach us about this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us this person, the narrator, in whose voice this ayah is written, he is lamenting, lamenting to Allah. I am overcome by the rejectors. Of course, by the rejectors. Sooner or later, maghloob, where do I say sooner or later? Because this is ism fa'il. Uh, sorry, ism maf'ul. Ism maf'ul, a, a passive participle. A, a passive participle, by definition, means present and or future. And or future. So in other words, he's admitting his people are not going to follow him. That's what he's saying. Fantasir. This is a command to the one reading or to the one receiving the Quran. Muhammad? Yes. Us? Yes. Fantasir. And therefore, seek divine succor or divine support. From whom? From Allah, of course. That's what the word intasir refers to. Intansurullah yansurkum. If you provide the sucker to the way of Allah, Allah will give you the sucker and the support. So seek sucker. That's an instruction to us. That's why it's written in the voice of the narrator, Jibreel in this case. And we, the angels, makes perfect sense now, open the gateways of the abstract understanding of the Torah with pouring divine water. When? Now. Or during the life of Muhammad Sallallahu We're going to see it, how we're going to convert this word, change this word, sama to samawat, so that it applies to us. Understanding of the Torah as sama with pouring divine rain at some point in time, it was happening. And we, the angels, caused the scripture to explode into wellsprings. And the divine water met upon a decree that has been measured. Now, this explains it. The divine decree of all of this water coming over and, and, and overflowing over the scripture, the first scripture, came to a point where it was measured. It wasn't going to continue forever. It wasn't going to continue forever. And thus, he's saying, Inni maghloob, eventually, sooner or later, I will be overcome. Overcome by whom? By his own people who reject him. And thus, the second and final scripture, the Quran, came. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, learn and apply and use the terminology. That's what we're going to do. We will use the terminology. رَبَّنَا افْتَحْ لَنَا أَبْوَابَ السَّمَاوَاتِ Not asama. Asama is past. Gone. You know, the, the Torah is no longer applicable. Now we have samawat, multiple layers of abstract understanding. رَبَّنَا افْتَحْ لَنَا أبواب السماوات بماء منهمر وفجر لنا الأرض عيونا واجعلنا ممن شكر Beautiful dua. 
I hope you memorize both of these dua and use them on a regular daily basis, inshallah. Rabbana iftah lana abwaab as-samawati bima'in munhamir wa fajjir lana al-arda uyunan wa ja'alna mimman shakar. Here's the translation. Our Lord, open for us the gateways of the layers of understanding with pouring divine water. Understanding. And explode the scripture with wellsprings of good understanding. Of course, that's how uyun, uyun is used throughout the Quran to refer to that, describing the Jannah, Al Jannah in this life for us, wellsprings of good understanding for us, and render us among the ones who communicate with you. Mimman shakar, those who do shukur. So this dua is very, very beautiful, very appropriate, inshallah. You will repeat it, you will memorize it, uh, take a screenshot of it, do whatever you need to do to make sure that you have uh, access to these defense mechanisms because these defense mechanisms will protect us against the uh, ajus. So let's jump into now examples of mauj from the story of Surah 27. As we have done in Surah Yusuf, when we explain Surah Yusuf, we have looked at the architecture of the story and we have decided at that time in the 30 part series we have decided to take the parts that elucidate which usually are later and then we come back to understand the earlier earlier part of the surah it worked beautifully as those who who uh, followed that series from beginning to end and inshallah you will be among them uh, as those understand we're going to do a similar thing in here so we're not going to start from the very, very beginning of the story because it involves some other aspects of the story that we're not ready to tackle. We need to understand the part where um, there's a dialogue between Suleiman and Muhammad and Musa, and then you know what happened with that dialogue so that we can understand the speech, the double speak of that woman, and then you start to understand. And then we're going to go toward later in the same surah, surah 27, to understand another definition or, or declaration by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about nine people who were actually doing the same thing as this woman. And you're going to see the link. And this completes the story or continues the story, providing us more keys to understand. So it's, it's a little bit of a, of a challenge, so bear with me. If you don't understand it the first go, review it again and again until you get it. It's really critical. So at one point in time, Sulaiman says, to Muhammad, go with my book here. Why do we say to Muhammad? Because remember, we've talked about Sulaiman being part of Ma Bainahuma. Ma Bainahuma don't have access to direct access uh, to, to direct action in the physical world. They act through living human beings, and we refer to those as uh, Bilad. So, as the Quran defines them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us this, this understanding that someone is instructing someone else to take this scripture or this book. By the way, book doesn't necessarily mean the whole, mean the whole scripture of the Quran, all 6,236 ayah, not necessarily. So a book sometimes in one surah it refers to hadha kitab, this book, and other, other uh, surah, dhalik al-kitab, and so on and so forth. So not necessarily all one scripture, as some people claim. Every kitab may be separated as part of a surah or a, a, a self-contained surah. Or sometimes a kitab spans multiple parts of surahs. So, so that's part of the difference between kitab and Quran. It have bi kitabi hadha, go with my book here, this one, this one. The Quran is referring to the Quran. All of it? No, this kitab. We're going to see. This story, which is narrated by Sulaiman in the story, you're in the surah, you're going to see some of more some more details as we keep going. So th this is the challenge. I, I had to translate a, an early ayah based on how the later ayahs uh, provided us explanation for it. So, and this is the challenge of the Quran. If you take one ayah at a time and forget about it three, three or four ayat later, you missed it. You missed the understanding. So they're all related and usually they're backward references. They're references to earlier ayat to give you clues and, and keys. I, I hope what I said uh, makes sense. So, 
So take this book, this story specifically, and you're going to see it, and deliver it to them, whom we're going to see, uh, the, the, the people of, of this woman, or the people under the control of this woman, because earlier in the story, he's talking about finding this woman who is under, who, who is controlling them, and she is from Seba, and so on and so forth. We're going to come back to some more detail, but I'm focusing on her speech, only her speech, so we can understand how she talks, how she claims certain things that borrow in our or their minds and misrepresent what she's trying to do. Deliver it to them and then turn away from them, meaning step back or, you know, wait, and then wait, decide regarding what they respond. Here, we're going to come back to this ayah a little bit later because there is a little bit of a problem in the way he articulated uh, the sentence. I'm going to come back to this. Just hold on. This is where we get into her speech. She said, she, the woman, how? In her role as, I'm going to use this word, Karin, but it's really not the appropriate word, as we said in the uh, ayah, in the segment 171. She's not really a Qareen. That's a different uh, preacher, so to speak. It's a different role. They're not just Qareen. They have a similar role to the Qareen. Again, in a future segment, please be patient. Don't ask me about this. All of these details are coming, but there's so much information to lay out. We're going to take it one chunk at a time. Not, not one morsel, because it's not enough to give you one morsel at a time. One chunk of food at a time, inshallah. So in her role to the people of Saba, قالت, she said, in other words, remember, she doesn't speak directly. She speaks through some human beings. In other words, somebody was there speaking what she is teaching them, what she's inserting in their Weltanschauung. We're going to see. قالت, يا أيها الملأ. Oh, notables. Inni ulqiya ilayya kitabun kareem. To me was delivered a soft whispering message. This is a clear indication of the Quran. This is a clear description of the Quran. Wa innahu la Quranun kareem. Next ayah is separated, and we're going to explain why. Jibreel actually is the one who said that. It is from Sulaiman. It is from Sulaiman. Jibreel is saying it is from Sulaiman. I promised you, Jibreel is going to interfere, interject into something that was composed by Suleiman because Jibreel wants to make sure to protect us from not understanding correctly what's going on. So he's, he's telling us, and he's telling Muhammad, إِنَّهُ مِنْ Sulaiman. What else? She also understood it to be from Suleiman. How? We're going to see. So both. So this ayah is separated because it brings a lot more knowledge than it would have if it was included in the same ayah up here. So, Jibreel is saying this, إِنَّهُ مِنْ سُلَيْمَانِ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is affirming to us, وَإِنَّهُ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ It is the Qur'an. That's why I said, Kitabun Karim is the Qur'an. But it is composed by Sulaiman. Jibreel is confirming this. What else? The woman, when she received it, she recognized it as... Mm, double speak. Who do I know? Who did I work with in the past? Suleiman. It is from Suleiman, and Suleiman is actually mentioned explicitly in some of this kitab, this story, this letter, so to speak. Pay attention because now the, the double speak is getting a little more dangerous, more serious. Allah ta'lu alayya wa muslimin. It commands us, of course, this is part of her speech, so she stopped in here, and there's an interjection in here, as I said, and that's double speech too, double speak too. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us an example of a double speak that he can do, that Jibreel on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. So Jibreel inserted this, and she understood it also in a slightly different way. You're going to see what that means it it's it's the direct application of a later ayah we're going to see where it says and they were treacherous and allah was treacherous too so in this kitab that is actually delivered to her this ayah existed so it confirms it is from sulaiman 
well, what does that mean? She understood it in one way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to teach us throughout the rest of the story that it's meant in a totally different way. What is the message of that kitab? What is the primary sort of directive given to the people of Saba in the kitab sent from Sulaiman? Remember, who sent the book? Who sent that scripture? Muhammad. Muhammad, he was the Nabi. He was the prophet. So he is getting an instruction from his guide. Remember, in YT171, we said Muhammad not only had Jibreel, but also under the tutelage and control and monitoring of Jibreel, Sulaiman. Sulaiman was there. Actually, the yad, the hand. Who was monitoring? Who was being the adult in the room? Jibreel. Jibreel was giving us an instruction. We're going to see other instructions coming. The message of the kitab says, Allah ta'lu, that you should not be elevating yourself above me. Well, who's me in here? Who's me? It depends who's reading or who's hearing this double speak. So in the Quran, it gives us instruction not to elevate ourselves about, above Allah. Yeah. So the readers of the Quran understand this to mean don't elevate yourself above Allah. Allah is the narrator or the voice of the narrator in this ayah. But what else? In Nahumin Sulaiman. What did she understand with it? She understood, don't elevate yourself above the Sulaiman. Well, he's talking to human beings, of course. But he knew, you will see later, he knew that they are under her control. And therefore, he had to be careful how to couch the words. In Nahumin Sulaiman. In Nahumin Sulaiman. That's what she's declaring, remember. In Nahumin Sulaiman. Allah ta'lu alayya. That means. In her understanding, me refers to Sulaiman. Don't elevate yourself above me, above Sulaiman. So she understood it to be Sulaiman returning to continue her mission as her disciple. Ah, now she has a little bit of a suspicion that the, the, the kitab that got to her, the Quran, part of the Quran, was not uh, protected. So she's saying Sulaiman got to them. So listen, Allah ta'alu alayya wa'tuni muslimin. Muslimin to whom? Submitting to whom? To her, in her mind, and in the mind of those pupils of her, under her control, it's Sulaiman speaking to them. Ah, so now we can follow Sulaiman. We don't have to follow Muhammad. Double speak. We continue. You're going to see it even more. Qalat, ya ayyuhal mala. يا أيها الملأ إف أفتوني في أمري ما كنت قاطعة أمرا حتى تشهدون um, she is uh, uh, this is where I had a lot of challenges producing the translation so I'm going to give you two different translations one which deals with the superficial layer the, the, the Zina layer that her ملأ may have understood if they don't understand the code for the, if they don't understand the, the detailed speech, they will understand it one way. Unfortunately, all the books of Tafsir understood it this way. And I'll leave you to conclude what that means regarding their affiliation with al malak So that's the first interpretation. But there is a dissected interpretation, understanding under the surface. And I highlighted it in yellow so we can understand. So I hope you understand. The same speak, the same speech coming out from someone under her control, under the control of the woman. I know it says Qalat, but remember, she cannot speak directly. She has to speak through a human being. So that human being is actually making the pronunciation, the, the enunciation, the, the expressions that we see in here. Qalat, ya ayyuhal mala'u. By the way, is it possible that it's a king or a queen in real life? It's possible, yes. Is it possible that some of the kings and the queens and the sultans and the emir and, and so on and so forth throughout history did the same thing? Yes, it is possible. Qalat, ya ayyuhal mala'u. O notables, meaning those who give her opinion around her. O notables, provide me with an opinion regarding my corrupt undertaking. Provide me with an op opinion regarding my, I put corrupt between parentheses, you'll see why. Regarding my undertaking. How did the books of Tafsir understand it? The books of Tafsir understood it as she is seeking their opinion. 
hey, she's a great woman, wonderful. And by the way, I myself have taught this when I used to teach Islamic leadership classes and we had seminars in different parts of the US and other parts. I used to use this example, look how great she is. She seeks the opinion of those around her, wonderful. And by the way, this is confirmed by another Janah, the Malik, the Malik, the king in the story of Yusuf, used the ser same terminology. Ya yuhal malaw aftuni fi ru'yaya. Using the same terminology. Wonderful. We have a janah. Wait. Don't hold. Don't don't um, finalize your decision until you understand when we dissect it, how it turns out to be something totally different. So she says, oh, notables, grant me or share with me an opinion regarding my undertaking. By the way, the word amr is not necessarily good in the Quran, as we saw in the story of Yusuf. Wallahu ghalibun ala amrihi. Allah shall uh, overcome the, the undertaking of the man who purchased Yusuf. Because as you saw in Surah Yusuf, there was a plot to use Yusuf as an agent, a sort of secret agent, very close to the king, so that they get the, the, the secrets of the king. Again, I'm, I don't want to spoil it. Go back to the story of Yusuf, the 30-part series, and you will enjoy it, I promise. But the word Amr is not necessarily a good word. But here, books of Tafsir, and the, the uninitiated among the people hearing her understood, oh, I need some help in making the decision. So give me an opinion. And then she continues. مَا كُنْتُ قَاطِعَةً أَمْرًا حَتَّى تَشْهَدُونَ I have not been one to decide my undertaking, to make a decision, basically, until you witness. What does that mean, until you witness? That means until you contribute, to participate in the decision-making process, and you're part of it. That's not what she's saying. Here's the second part, which is really what she's saying. When we apply the Abrahamic locution to her speech, how do we know this? Because we're learning it from all other places in the Quran. So we're not making it up. We go and understand how the word Amr is used. Why is she using Aftuni fi ru'yaya or fi Amri in this case? And ma kuntu qati'atan. What does that mean? Tashhadun. What does that mean? Now we understand the concepts that are surrounding this, this woman in her non-physical ability to influence. Now she's saying something totally different. Watch. She's saying... I'm not to bring an end to my corrupt undertaking, my amr. What is my amr? My amr is the situation that Sulaiman is telling her about with Muhammad. She thought Sulaiman was telling her about with Muhammad. So she understood the book, the book that she received, the, the letter, the kitab she received from Sulaiman. She understood it to be a call for help. So she referred to Muhammad and his companions as corrupt undertaking. This is something I have to deal with. How do I deal with it? I have to terminate it, bring an end to it. Qati'a. This is what qata'a. Qati'a dabiru al-qawm al-mujrimin. So, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used that word to terminate, to bring an end. So she's saying qati'a. I'm not going to bring an end to that undertaking. Their corrupt undertaking I'm facing with Muhammad. Until you provide testimony. What does that mean, tashhadun? Well, you have to provide the physical reports. You're my ears and eyes. I cannot have access to the physical world. You, the living human beings, have to be my eyes and ears. So you provide your reports about them to me will have to be provided after I send you there. Why do I say after I send you there? Obviously, Muhammad is in a different place, different location. She is connected and supervising and overseeing another group of people in Saba. Muhammad is in Medina or Mecca, we, depending on when this surah was revealed. The point is, this is part of the training for Muhammad. Now, what is she saying? She's saying, you have to physically be there to be my witnesses. Not tashhadun to provide a testimony. No, to literally provide the eyes and ears on my behalf to bring me the knowledge. So right away we learn something that was corroborated. They went searching through the physical bodies, the living human beings. This is a confirmation or a janah to that understanding. You have to be there. Tashhadun, you are my witnesses. You are my ears and eyes. Therefore, agents 
on her behalf and they will be able to provide her the knowledge. Well, how does that work? Well, once the living person goes from Sabah to al Medina and pretend to be a Muslim, we're going to see it in the surah. That person, if just pretending to be a Muslim and does not reject his connection with uh, the, the false double speak that she provides, he just became an agent for her. So in other words, if you don't cleanse your terminology, pay attention, this is very dangerous what I'm saying. This is why I told you at the beginning, this will shake you to the core. If you don't make a determined effort to cleanse the terminology you're using, and you stick with what you taught, what you were taught, and what you taught, thinking it is correct instead of the Quranic terminology, the Abrahamic locution, then you are still providing ears and eyes to that woman and her followers. Her followers in Ma Bainahuma. I just said a lot of things. I hope you stop the video and watch it again because it really needs to be heard. Let me say it again slowly. If you don't make a deliberate, determined decision to rid yourself, to get rid of the erroneous teachings regarding the terminology and the expressions, and you continue using what we were taught erroneously that contradicts or conflicts with the Abrahamic locution, you are the ears and eyes for that woman and those who follow in her way. Which people? The people in Ma Bainahuma. Are there people in Ma Bainahuma? Yeah, we talked about it last time. We're going to detail it in future segments, fully dissected. I hope you understand the, the severity of what I'm saying, the critical nature. Does this explain what happened to the believers and the Muslims in the last 1400 years? Absolutely. Is Allah teaching us right there? Hatta tashhadun. You have to be my eyes and ears. You have to provide the testimony, the reporting. You're the, the sort of remote, remote sensors. I cannot operate if we don't have physical beings, living human beings, in their midst. We continue. They replied. They answered, Qalu. What does that mean, Qalu? Well, they're speaking to themselves because they're hearing the voice in their own head. They're, they're convinced that this is what we need to do. So she is telling them up here in their head, and they're saying, this is what we have to do. We have to go and be physically there, actively monitoring what's going on so that we can make a decision. That's what they're telling themselves. The voice behind the self is her voice. So they answer, not necessarily answering directly to her, but they're, they're, this is a theatrical sort of answer, as we've seen in so many other uh, stories. They said, we are ulu quwwatin. We possess power over the scriptural text. Remember, with Yahya, Ya Yahya, khudil kitaba bi Have certainty, have strength, have, have determination. Don't, don't have fear. Inshallah, we have the quwwa. They're, they're claiming we are uh, possessors of power over the scriptural text. Which scriptural text? What they think is the scriptural scriptural text. Wa ulu ba'sin shadidin, and we possess military might in case it becomes necessary to fight against Muhammad. In other words, they're gonna go there. They're gonna be confronting physically, confronting. Well, amru ilayki, and the command is to you, and therefore decide. Fanduri, therefore decide. They're waiting for further instructions. Are they doing this conscientiously? No. Uh, I'm sorry, let me repeat the question. Are they doing this consciously? Of course not. They're doing this because these voices are playing like a conversation in their head. So they're saying, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll think, we'll reflect, uh, we will wait, and then we will decide, and then we will take an order to go there. And we're going to see it. So we continue. قالت إن الملوك إذا دخلوا قرية أفسدوها وجعلوا أعزة أهلها أذلة وكذلك يفعلون. She said, indeed, when the kings enter a cottery, 
she's thinking, you know, she's talking to certain people in general. Again, remember, there's a physical human being making the speech, talking to others. So that physical human being used the word qariya, our qariya. So she said, إِنَّ الْمُلُوكَ إِذَا دَخَلُوا قَرْيَةً أَفْسَدُوهَا They corrupt it. وَجَعَلُوا أَعِزَّةَ أَهْلِهَا أَذِلَّةً And they render the elites among its people humiliated. I'll continue with this last part in just a few seconds. I want you to pay real close attention because this is an excellent example of double speak. So she's talking to people of Saba through a human being. Remember, not directly. She can't communicate except through the, the, the subconscious messages to whom uh, she has access with a human being. That human being can actually communicate what he hears, what he thinks is correct. So that human being is articulating the following words. In al muluka, the kings, the kings, when they enter a cottery, they corrupt it. In the speech to the population, so to speak, in the speech to the population, articulated on behalf of that woman, they used qariya. Now, qariya means a cottery. That means they're all sort of united or you know, following blindly in the same opinion. Is it possible that a king in that seba qariya would address his people as qariya? No. But that's how they don't understand the terminology. Say, oh, yeah, yeah, we're qariya, we're qariya. And if the kings, meaning Muhammad and his followers, act as kings and come in, they will destroy us. They will corrupt us. They will change our ways. And they will bring the elevated ones, the elite, they will bring the, the sort of the unassailable uh, you know, classes, the upper classes, they will bring them down. That's how kings act. What is she doing? She's scaring people. Did they buy this concept? Yes. Even though she used qariya, well, they don't know the terminology of qariya. Remember, she's trying to manipulate the, the terminology and corrupt the lexicon. So to them, it's a, it's a done deal. It is already a qariya. We're a qariya, a small, small group. We're not you know, that, that powerful, so to speak. So we accept we're a qariya. So she is causing fear in them against Muhammad. That's the superficial layer. The layer beneath it's saying something much more dangerous. Watch. She is saying, when we apply the Abrahamic locution to her speech, we find her saying, indeed, when the kings, us, they are the kings. They represent themselves, the kings. Remember when we talked about Allahumma, we said it includes kings and judges and the, and the upper echelons. Allahumma, that's the definition in the Hebrew uh, definition. Elohim. This is what they're thinking about. The kings. Who are the kings? We are the kings. What qariya are they referring to then? The qariya of Muhammad. They consider Muhammad a corrupt undertaking as we saw. So it's a flip-flop type, type of speech. So to those who know the code, they're saying, here's our plot. Here's what we plan to do. We're going to go as kings and corrupt them. Afsaduha, they're going to corrupt it, their qariya. We are not a qariya. They are the qariya meaning they are referring to Muhammad and his, his, his state and his company and his uh, uh, collaborators or, or companions as qariya. And then they, meaning the kings, we in this case, because they're talking about themselves. The kings in this case is referring to themselves. When her emissaries go to Muhammad and his companions, they, the kings, create ulterior motives in it. Cultivate hypocrites and disinformation promoters in the cottery of Muhammad. This is the layer below the obvious layer. I hope I'm not losing you. This is, this is significant, but I don't know how else to do it in a way that explains it. And they render the unassailable of its cohorts, A'izzata Ahliha, Muhammad and his companions, they render them humiliated. So what's their plan? Their plan is to send, quote-unquote, kings from among themselves, kings, you know, qualified people. And remember, they describe themselves as having quwa and ulubats. They're going to send a group of them into the qariya of Muhammad and corrupt it. 
Am I imagining these things? No, you're going to see it directly in front of you, confirmed within the same surah, just a few ayat later, when we talk about the nine people. So Allah did not leave us to guess, and Hani is not making it up. You're going to see it with your own eyes. And they make the, the uh, unassailable, meaning the upper, you know, um, group who are really on solid ground they make them humiliated is this all imaginary watch this and you have to recognize this because we've seen this before when we talked about uh, the she cow the segment about the she cow how to circumcise a she cow and we saw over there وَمَا كَادُوا يَفْعَلُونَ and we interpreted it and explained it and proved it that whatever they plotted in the past, they were still doing at the time of revelation, of revelation of that story, Surah Al-Baqarah. Here, وَكَذَلِكَ يَفْعَلُونَ This is the word of Allah. Allah, this is not her words. This is not the word of anyone else. This is not part of their speech. This is Allah closing with a signature, explaining to us. And this is indeed how they are currently planning and acting. Currently, يفعلون. present tense, does it apply only to Muhammad? <clears throat> no, it applies to Muhammad and afterwards. وكذلك يفعلون, they're still doing it. So what did Muhammad understand from this? He understood that this is double speak. And we're going to see later how, how Muhammad uh, wakes up to this revelation and understanding. And then uh, how Sulaiman takes the right role in setting a trap for her, as we said. So, so far, it's, it's really complicated, but we have barely scratched the surface. We're going to continue. وَإِنِّي مُرْسِلَةٌ إِلَيْهِمْ بِهَدِيَّةٍ And I shall send them with a gift, or send to them a gift, with a gift. Send, let me repeat it. And I shall send to them with a gift. بِهَدِيَّةٍ Not مُرْسِلَةٌ إِلَيْهِمْ هَدِيَّةٍ إِنِّي مُرْسِلَةٌ بِهَدِيَّةٍ With a gift. So, there's a gift and there is... The, the messengers she's sending, or the mursaloon as she refers to them, al mursaloon, and then wait for what the emissaries bring back. bima al mursaloon. Let me make a stop here and um, detail the concept of raja'ah. We saw this in the story of Yusuf. As you've noticed, this story has a lot of similar terminology that is borrowed from the story of Yusuf. Did the story of Yusuf exist in its Quranic original form in the book of Musa? The answer is yes, but it was corrupted. The interpretation made it into the version of the Torah that we have and that Muhammad Sallallahu had during his time. Corrupted. So whatever the story that we can learn from the, the so-called Tanakh, the, the Torah, is already corrupted even by the time of Muhammad But at the time of Musa, remember Yusuf is before Musa. At the time of Musa, that story was presented correctly. So she is using that terminology from the book of Musa all over her speech. Why? We're going to see in a few seconds, a few minutes maybe. It's very important to realize this. So her words, her expressions are definitely plagiarized, you know, copied, brought from the original scripture of Musa. How did she come across it? Well, she remember, Ajuz, she's ancient. She's been doing this for a long time, baby. And she has a lot of experience. So she has seen so many uh, before this person or that person. So she's aware she was with Sulaiman as we um, talked, but we didn't prove yet. So we will see a little bit more in this uh, in this part. So I'm sending to them with a hadiyah. Now, why did I go through this whole speech about Yusuf and the relationship with the story of Yusuf? Because in the story of Yusuf, فَلَمَّا سَمِعَتْ This is the Imra'at al-Aziz, the woman, uh, the subordinate woman under the king. When she heard about their treachery, meaning her treachery rumors, came back to her. They arrived back. Those rumors circulated and came back to her. She heard them indirectly, of course. But she started it. That's the whole idea. 
she started those rumors. She is setting a plot and she knew this is Mecker. And then when that Mecker came back to her, meaning the, the rumors circulated enough, أرسلت إليهن, أرسلت إليهن, and we proved in that series about Yusuf that that was instructions to conduct a plot or to execute a plan, a plan that suits her, which is to get rid of Yusuf. وَإِنِّي مُرْسِلَةٌ إِلَيْهِمْ The exact same terminology. So those who understand the story of Yusuf have no problem going to the second part, the understanding of what she really means. Those who stay at the superficial layer, unfortunately, as all the books of Tafsir did, they stayed at, oh, وَإِنِّي مُرْسِلَةٌ إِلَيْهِمْ I'm sending to them a gift. Well, it says, بِهَدِيَّةٌ It says, إِلَيْهِمْ in the way that Surah Yusuf used it. Does that cause you to think and reflect and try to match and find, you know, proper understanding that Allah does not make exceptions or, you know, does not make mistakes and stuff with Allah? Of course, you should have thought of this. So when we compared the two, it became very obvious what's going on. She is plotting something just like Imra'at al-Aziz did the same thing with these gossiping women. So she says... I shall send messengers with instructions, mursilatun ilayhim, that's what it means in the locution of the scripture. Through a gift, through a gift or with a gift, both apply, bihadiyatin, and then be looking to decide using what the emissaries indicate. Bima yarji'u al-mursalun. Now why is, this, why is this alarming for me who is familiar with the term raja? Remember, <clears throat> in the story of Yusuf, we saw Yusuf speaking to his ex-prison mate. Remember, when the ex-prison mate came and he brought the report from the king, not a, not a dream, yes, a report from the king, and Yusuf interpreted that dream before the interpretation, sorry, interpreted that report, uh, before that interpretation was given to the, to the ex-prisoner, the ex-prisoner says, Perchance I shall come, go back to the people and resume my mission. Which mission? The mission that Yusuf tasked him with before leaving the prison. So we said that ex-prisoner became a Muslim and Yusuf tasked him with a task to relay certain information to the king. And that was a mission. Well, he forgot it. So when he came back with the report from the king, he is bringing, he's bringing uh, uh, himself back to go back into that mission. So he says, لَعَلِّي أَرْجِعُ Perchance I shall return to my mission. أَرْجِعُ إِلَى النَّاسِ Okay. So, رَجَعَ is not a transitive verb. أَرْجِعُ I return. رَجَعَ يَرْجِعُ أَرْجِعُ رَجَعَ So all of those verbs are not transitive. So here, it's used in a transitive way. Bima yarji'ul mursalun. She is corrupting the speech. She is corrupting the speech. Bima yarji'ul mursalun. That means she's using it in a transitive way. Bima is referring to a maf'ul bihi. Maf'ul bihi to the verb raja'a. Where else did we see this? Well, we saw it up here. I told you we're going to come back to it. We go back up here. Mada yarji'un. Remember, these ayat are written in the book that Muhammad sent to be delivered, meaning recited, to the people of Saba. Keep this in mind. So, the, so whoever is reading it is reading the literal words of the, of the scripture. What did they include in those words from Sulaiman? Please pay attention. This is critical. What was included in the words by Sulaiman? I told you, in Nahum in Sulaiman. It's written by Sulaiman, composed by Sulaiman, through Muhammad, delivered through Muhammad, and then Muhammad sent someone to recite it to people of Saba in supposedly Yemen. And by the way, the Sira confirms this. So I don't need to make things up. Those of you who are aware of the Sira, you understand what I'm saying. I shouldn't say confirm, corroborate. The Sira corroborates this. So, idhab bi kitabi hada falqihi ilayhim thumma tawalla anhum fanzur, madha yarji'oon. 
and decide regarding what they respond. Well, that's not the, the, the perfect translation because he means it this way. He means it this way. But the way it's written, raja is not a transitive verb. So, fanvor, mada yaruddun, mada yaqulun. Yeah, maybe. But he used the word yarji'un. Why? Because it's part of the plot that's already being weaved against her. You're going to see how the plot is going to develop through the whole story to trap her into thinking Suleiman is in charge and Suleiman is one of your disciples. Yeah, he pretended to be a Muslim, but you're going to see all of that is going to be cleared away and she's going to fall into the trap. The beginning of setting the trap is part of the speech in here being wrong. Why? Because she understood this is from Suleiman. She understood this is from Suleiman. He's using this word in the wrong way. He's using the verb raja as a transitive verb, not as an intransitive verb as it's used in Surah Yusuf. Remember, the basis for all of this uh, determination is the correct understanding of the story of Yusuf. So those of you who have not watched the story of Yusuf or did not internalize all of the detailed you know, criteria and, and, and instruments of conclusion, you're not going to agree with this. You're not going to understand it. Please don't comment and don't argue because you don't know what you're arguing about. Go back to the story of Yusuf and really internalize it. And this will become very obvious. So the verb raja'a is not a transitive verb according to the Abrahamic locution. Here, whoever wrote this purposefully used it in a transitive manner. And to confirm to us that this is wrong, the speech of her... This is a signal. He's giving her a signal. Oh, I'm using your speech. She said the same thing in here. I'm going to wait and decide what they return. Does she know this is the wrong speech? Perhaps. But those who are listening to her don't necessarily know the terminology. What? Remember, what's her task? What's her mission? To corrupt, to corrupt the accurate use of the terminology. Dr. Haney, are you saying the understanding of the correct understanding, the accurate understanding of the accurate Abrahamic locution gets down to that level of detail? Yes, it does. Do we have to work hard? Yes, you have the rest of your life. And inshallah, you will be among the people of al Firdaus continuing to learn. Will the ilm of Allah ever expire or you know be fully exposed don't count on it so this is just a hint of some of the tricks that are hidden in all of this speech it's difficult i know but that's why we use the dua we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open up to us all of these details so this is the paragraph i wanted to cover and now you see how it's already producing some amazing uh, information so there is double speak going on, double speak on her part, and Suleiman is starting to in to to sort of imply, to hint at that he's still in her camp. He's still corrupting the speech in the Quran by using the terminology in the wrong way. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Why? Because he's setting a trap, and we're gonna see in the rest of the story, which we're not gonna cover today. In the rest of the story, Suleiman is going to entrap her. And at the end of this story, well, the end as they told us, Ayah 44, she realizes she's been had. And of course, based on what we saw in, uh, in segment 170 and 171, what happens to those who are caught purposefully corrupting, as we saw from Musa, shall punish him a grievous punishment and I will expose or, or I will expose his convictions true convictions the onus is on him the other person in to bring me clear authoritative evidence of his innocence of his sincerity of his seriousness about seeking repentance I hope you understand now what, what's going on so Suleiman is on the right side. Yes. That's why we saw in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَمَا كَفَرَ Sulaiman. He's never uh, committed kufr. He didn't get to the point of committing kufr. But he fell in the trap of this. He fell into 
not really taking the words very seriously and he started confusing them and he made the wrong dua yes of course there's nothing wrong with that as long as you repent and you realize what you've done because he was a teacher he was an abbey so he fell prey victim so why is this story important to muhammad don't do the same thing pay attention later on we're gonna see what will happen to the rest of muhammad's community so all of this is not just empty story for entertainment purposes about a woman who exposed her legs ah, ah, ooh, ooh. men in tents are just going crazy at that image <laughs> of course it's not about that it's something much more significant much more serious where do we go from this uh, sorry where do we go with this or from this understanding um, into the rest of the quran tons of geysers exploding wellsprings are going to open up and now we're starting to, to sort of have a microscope in our hand, ex, you know, ex, explaining or examining every word we read. Is this used in the right way or not? Is this speech duplicitous, double speak? If it is, provably, what do we say about the person who is saying it? Ah, so is this a way for Allah to provide us proofs, burhan? about some of the claims we have made in the Quran, in, on this channel. Yes, it is. And you're going to see it. There are very good questions. I'm going to leave some of the questions to later. Like I said, this is a huge ball of yarn and we can't get into it all at once. The best I can do is one morsel at a time, one bite at a time, look man, and inshallah we will keep going. You just You need to be patient. There's no other way to do this. Just like we did with the story of Yusuf. It took 30 segments. I'm not sure it will take 30 segments for this series, but we're going to keep going until we cover it all. I promise you, we're not going to leave any part of the story of Suleiman un, uh, unexposed. Be patient. Uh, inshallah, you will benefit. Uh, I'm sorry if the screen is blurry, but... Um, yeah, so uh, there's a question. Did Suleiman also use Raja? Yes, I did. I explained it. I just explained it. Um, that he did as part of the setup. Suleiman knows better in the in the stage at which he is helping compose the story. And by the way, it would not pass by uh, Jibril <laughs> to be used that way unless uh, Jibril is starting to understand what's going on. So Suleiman is sending a scripture to that woman that purposefully includes includes the wrong usage of the terminology. Dr. Haney, well, the Quran may have the wrong usage of terminology. Just be patient. You're going to see, not only here, in other places. But once you understand how to look for the right signals that this is used in the wrong way, that detection, that understanding will reveal tons of new information to us. So we understand now there's a plot, and the plot is starting very early in the story. So when she's reading the story or hearing the story through human beings in Sabah, she's saying, ah, oh, that term is wrong. So that means whoever is doing it got to corrupt the Quran itself. That's what she understood. But it's not. You're going to see more and more as we keep going with this story. So what did this woman do that's so bad? Number one, she uses a lot of references to real scriptural expressions. As we saw, Ya yuhal mala'u aftuni, ma kuntu qati'atan amran, etc., etc. To give herself the appearance of credibility and legitimacy. Remember, she's not speaking directly. She's speaking through a human being. In other words, somebody is acting on her behalf and getting the appearance of credibility and legitimacy. Does this happen in our communities, our masjid, our meetings? Somebody starts blabbering with some you know, key Arabic words here and there, especially if they're not good Arabic speakers. They love to do this. I know these Arabic words. I'm going to start using them. Why? to give themselves credibility and legitimacy, where in reality they know nothing. This is a lesson. We need to learn this. She uses the terminology in a deliberately perverted manner. She creates mauj. This is exactly what the definition of mauj is. Waves. They lead you deeper into the sea of confusion. She is given control over the Weltanschung of some people. What do you mean she's given control? She's allowed... And we will see more and more as we study more about Ma Bainahuma and the Ghabirin and all of the tricks that these people have access to. I told you, this move, this, this segment 
is going to shake you to the core. But believe me, this is going to be just the tip of the iceberg today. You're going to see a lot more scary and dangerous. And, you know, there's a word that's used to describe this stuff that's going to blow you away. But you have to be patient because that's coming in two or three segments later. We can't get to it yet. She's given control over the Weltanschung of some people. Remember, walaha arshun. To her belongs a Weltanschung, a arsh. The arsh becomes the dominating arsh over some people. By the will of Allah, Allah lets that happen? No. By the choice of those people themselves. How do they make that choice, Dr. Haney? They don't work hard to do the toiling and to really extract the detailed knowledge from the Quran. That's a simple answer. That's why I've been telling you, toiling is so pressured, precious. Toil toiling is irreplaceable. There's no other way to do it. We have to do it the hard way. Well, what if I'm not qualified to toil on more than one or two words per month? That's good enough. Keep going. You'll get better at it. We find ourselves today in 2024, we find ourselves, all Muslims, find us ourselves reeling and suffering from the effects of hundreds of years of colonialism and 1400 years of wrong teachings at the hands of some people who claim to be scholars. It's not my doing. It's not my action. I'm just pointing to you, say, be careful. This is what's happening to us. We need to wake up and start finding our way back to the Quran. Finding our way back to the Quran, not just to recite it and get hasanat from every letter we recite. No. Finding our way to the Quran to find the insights in every letter we read. We read, not just recite. We engage, we toil, we do tadabbur on. That's how you get a lot more insight. As you saw me do, you know, already in this segment, and in every segment before. So these segments are just examples for you to do your own toiling. If you can't, just follow. Follow us and learn the methodology and keep practicing until it becomes second nature to you. I promise you, I promise you, there are people who know nothing about Arabic to whom Allah is giving beautiful gifts. So Allah will not hold back until you perfect your knowledge and mastery of Arabic, no. Allah will start giving you gifts at his own choice if he knows your Weltanschung is in the right path, you know, position, path, and your heart is on the right path. So start, don't wait, make this dua, listen to what we are saying to learn, not to apply blindly, to learn. And inshallah, you will apply the method and you will reach the similar conclusions. So she's given control over the Weltanschung. So again, how do those people make themselves submit to her by refusing to learn the Weltanschung, the, by, by refusing to learn the correct terminology. So everyone who is attacking this channel and claiming the Abrahamic locution is, is a fallacy and bogus, guess what? They immediately invite her and allow her and her ilk to take control over their mind. It's a very simple process. You don't want the terminology Allah taught you, guess what? I'm going to remand you to those who want to corrupt the terminology. And thus, they will lead you further and further into confusion and darknesses. She sent a gift with a collection of nine people, we're going to see it next, to spread misinformation and confusion among the cohorts of Muhammad wasallam. And finally, she is intent, and perhaps still is, on corrupting the understanding of the Quranic divine lexicon, even after Muhammad Sallallahu and we're going to see this. Remember, وَكَذَلِكَ يَفْعَلُونَ يَفْعَلُونَ is a present tense. We saw it in the ayah, up above. Now, by understanding her skills and intent, you can protect yourself from her influence. Very simple. And you can detect those who are under her influence. Ah, very practical. Some of them may be around us. Yes, you betcha. Does this explain all sorts of problems we've been having? Yes. And you watch. You just watch in silence, in modesty, 
in humility, in humbleness to Allah, and you'll start immediately recognizing, ah, this is the speech taught by this woman. I want to bring you to something we said earlier. Um, who spoke in the last ayah? Oh, before I forget, I apologize. I haven't said uh, there's something important. In the last segment, YT171, I said um, that ayah 27-23 is at the tongue of, of Suleiman. I, I, that was wrong. I meant 27-22. Uh, so if you're taking detailed notes, go back to your notes for 171 and correct that. Uh, what Suleiman said, and of course, if you remember, he's talking to Jibril because Jibril was skeptical and sort of cautious. And Suleiman says, uh, That's ayah 22. This is Suleiman speaking. The next ayah is actually Musa. So anyway, we will talk more about that part in a future segment. Here, we talked about this paragraph from Surah Hud. If you remember, we said this is the paragraph that lays out in detail exactly what her skills are and exactly how she talks and what she does and the effect, the net effect. And in this case, we said in YT171 that the first victim was Nuh's son, likely her son. And then we said, وَقِيلَ And it was said, let me bring this part. And it was said, وَقِيلَ يَا أَرْضُ بْلَعِ مَاءَكِ وَيَا سَمَاءُ أَقْلِعِ O scripture, swallow your water and all layer of abstract understanding stop. And this is the end of the quotation here. Question. I told you in YT171, we're going to deal with this issue. Who said? Who said? It doesn't say. The Quran doesn't say. قِيلَ Now, I want you to reflect on this for just one second and you understand because you already have enough knowledge to reach the conclusion. It was said, today we say, I heard a voice in my head. Somebody said, I don't know who. Qila, wa qila. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in some of the cases, most of the cases I've found so far, is giving us a hint that when you see this passive verb, meaning the subject is not known, is not told to us. Passive verb, somebody is hearing a voice. Hearing a voice? Allah is talking about us hearing voices? voices? Yeah, the whole story is about this, man. The whole story is about how certain influence is relayed to us in that fashion, in that manner. Waqila To whom? To everyone who is willing to listen to that. There is no divine guidance. You just interpret the text directly. You don't need to wait for Allah to teach you. Allah would not have sent us the book if it's not enough to understand it. We have to wait for the divine revelation, divine guidance from Allah. That's what they tell us all the time. As a matter of fact, all the books of tafsir say this. Not a single book of tafsir tell us the, the text is not explainable without direct the divine guidance to the receiver. Never anyone says that. They say, oh, we will tell you. The book of Tafsir tell you. We will tell you what it means. Well, where did you get it from? Well, the poet, this said that, and this person said that, and this companion has this opinion. Well, human individual opinions, not divine guidance. This is what it means. Ya ardu ma'aki. The scripture has no longer any water or any need for water swallow all of your water the scripture becomes dry who is whispering these types of instructions that lead to this conclusion the woman right there in the same paragraph so this this these waves became sort of between them and this is the result oh, uh, oh scripture swallow your water and all layer of abstract understanding stop giving us new guidance, meaning they're no longer looking for new guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what happened? And the water totally disappeared. Does this represent our status today? You betcha. And the matter was decreed. It's finished. And she became established upon the Judi. And we said that was Sulaiman and explained why. 
So this is her story. No question about this. So now we learn a new Bayina. When it was said, it was said, why is this important? Because in the next segment, in the next segment, we're going to see this happening in the story of Suleiman with this woman. And now we understand, ah, okay, so it was said, waqila, that means she's speaking in, in somebody's psyche. Is this possible to happen to us, Dr. Haney? Yeah, that's why I've been telling you, never trust a dhikra. For four years, I've been teaching you about dhikra. Well, since the story, or three years, since the story of Abasa, and I taught you about the concept of dhikra. And I've been telling you, never trust a dhikra. Those voices you hear aren't always guiding you. Sometimes they mean to misguide you. I'll be honest with you and confess, as I was preparing the notes for this week and last week, you have no idea how many times these voices were telling me, man, quit this. You don't need this. Go enjoy this. Go do that. And, you know, why should you put yourself at such a risk of teaching people the wrong things? And all sorts of voices were speaking. Alhamdulillah, I kept repeating the dua. And I feel very safe right now. But who knows? Who knows if any of us is really, truly, permanently safe as long as we live. As long as we live we may give her the keys to our own Velta Inshram. Let's continue. This is a surprise. Are women in general prohibited from any leadership position? Huh? What are you saying, Dr. Henry? What does it have to do with this segment? Just watch. I'm bringing, just for the sake of, of making you smile a little bit, something that seems unrelated, but you're going to see how relevant it is and how many lessons we learn. Okay, this is a narration. Well, we don't use narrations as a primary source, as I keep saying. But it's fun every once in a while to say, oh, I remember something they taught me in my first 30 years when I was just a promoter of, of all of these books of, of Tafsir. And now you understand why I had no choice to do what I'm doing right now, which is to expose the story just like Suleiman did. So... I remember this narration. A community who delegated their undertaking to a woman shall not succeed. And I, when I recall this, as I was preparing the notes, I started laughing like, oh my God, they have corrupted this narrator, narration so badly. And of course, the books of Tafsir, the misogynistic books of Tafsir, no question about it, understood this narration as they want, according to their predilections and biases, and according to their jinn ways of thinking, that women are not qualified to take positions of leadership. That's what they understood from this. But in reality, it's very simple now to understand Based on what we just saw, that small paragraph from the story of Surah An Naml, the woman, the woman, ma kuntu qati'atan amran wal amru ilayki. We saw this. Wal amru ilayki. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is teaching us about this group of people, this group of people who relayed or relegated their undertaking to that woman, not just any woman. This is not that. The genre of all women this is not condemning 50% of humanity to never be qualified for leadership. This is silly. This is sad. This is, it makes me want to cry how much we have missed in our history. Talented, creative human beings who were totally marginalized because of a stupid, bigoted, idiotic interpretation of six words claimed to be a narration. I don't know if I said it strong enough. I wish I had stronger words to say it. How much did we, the Muslims, miss in our history of potentially creative, brilliant leaders who are women just because of the bigoted, misogynistic, you know, closed-minded interpretations of, of people who come from behind cows? This is what happened. This narration... Is correct. It is sahih. No one can claim I'm making it up. I'm not saying Muhammad actually said that. But if it is, according to their methodology of tracing the Sanad, and these words are correctly 
what was what came out of Muhammad's mouth, they make perfect sense. They're talking about the story of Sulaiman with that woman. And he's teaching them, pay attention, that woman is evil. That woman, that woman is wrong. And Muhammad وسلم, is saying, anyone who follows her in, in delegating or relaying or you know, sort of assigning their affairs to her way of, of seeing, to her way of teaching, to her way of speaking, to her way of belief, they will fail. Lan yuflih. So the adhan says, Hayya ala al-falah. Now we understand what, what the adhan is possibly saying. I'm not saying it's correct or, or not. I'm just saying the word, falah, yuflih. So Muhammad is using the terminology of this story. Muhammad is using the correct understanding that we are sharing, alhamdulillah. This corroborates, is not the basis for us. This corroborates what we just said. So I give you all the references. I know some people are not going to like it. Some people are going to have existential crisis. As a matter of fact, they may be having existential crisis right now. Pompey, it's up to you. You want to keep following the wrong terminology and the wrong lexicon and deny us the opportunity to bring to you the beautiful nuggets from the Abrahamic locution. Pompey, you go follow that woman, follow her ways. And you're discussed by Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made, made this narration reach us somehow. I don't know why. I don't know how. But if those are the words of Muhammad, Muhammad spoke against you. I hope you can sleep well tonight. All right. Here's an unprecedented disclosure. Because no one has spoken about those nine people in the way we're going to talk about them. Direct evidence from the Quran that the corruption of the Quranic vocabulary or the understanding of the vocabulary started during Muhammad's life. So, um, so Muhammad's life included some of the stories in the Quran or was described by some of the stories of the Quran. Where do you get that, Dr. Haney? All sorts of stories are talking about Muhammad and his companions. You know that. If you don't know that, you haven't been reading the Quran. But there are clear ayat that say, this is the dhikr stories of those with me and those who came before me. So Muhammad is quoted in the Quran telling us ex explicitly these are the stories or some of them ap apply or happen during my life. We saw from uh, the story of Dhul Qarnayn. It is about the life story of Muhammad. We saw in the story of the companions of the cave, Ashabul Kahf. It's about Muhammad and his companions. And we saw, or we will see, inshallah, in the story of Musa and the so called Al Khudr, the wise man, or whatever you want to call them. It's not Al Khudr. It's also about the story of Muhammad and, and uh, somebody else with him in that story. So in Surah Al Kahf, this is important. Please pay attention for those of you who are flapping their mouth about my erroneous interpretation of the story of the two men and the two garden. Surah Al-Kahf, as I told you, teased you last week, contains four stories, an introduction, and some conclusion. All four stories relate to the same central theme of Surah Al-Kahf. Surah Al-Kahf is hiding some details about Muhammad in the form of stories. How many stories? Four. So therefore, when you take the second one, the story of the two men and the two gardens, and totally removed it from if its context and said, oh, it's just a good man and a bad man, or you know, one good guy, one bad guy, has nothing to do with Muhammad. Muhammad is not found anywhere in that story, as that person claimed. You really are Mujrimun. You are taking out of its context a story and interpret it according to your own hawa. And therefore, you started with that assumption and then planted into the story whatever you projected. So I hope this is really clear. We're going to find a lot more evidence and we're going to keep presenting because this woman is working through some channels right now. I guarantee you, this woman is working through the, some channels. Well, she's very capable and qualified and she's going to work through some of the mouthpieces on those channels. So is she gonna defend so-called Torah as correct? Yeah, 
he's doing it. He did it this week, as a matter of fact. Is she going to attack what Dr. Haney presented with evidence? Yeah, she did last month or two months ago, and so on and so forth. So just stay tuned. We're going to keep presenting more and more evidence. And why do I talk about these other channels? Because I'm aware of what's going on because of what I learned from the Quran and what we're learning from this story. We're going to continue. We're going to go a little faster so we can wrap up, inshallah, in about 15 minutes. So I hope I hope um, you remain patient. Um, this is from the same surah, but starting four ayat after 44. 44, remember, 44 is when they told us, um, is when they told us the story of that woman ended, Sulaiman and that woman. But no, it did not end, it continued. And in the Medina, what Medina? Al Medina, Al Medina, it's talking to Muhammad. Al Medina, your Medina. Why do you think he called the Ethrib Medina, Al Medina? You think he just made it up? What you tell us, he doesn't do anything without the direct instruction from Allah. Where did he get these instructions? Right there and in other places. Al Medina, that Medina. There were nine people who corrupt in the scripture and do not fix their corruption. And do not fix their corruption. Yeah, you're going to learn. Why is that relevant? Do you remember what they told us about what happened to that woman in Ayah 44? She became a Muslim. Well, these are the people she sent. You're going to see. Remember? Uh, so she sent nine people who are charged, tasked with creating this facade. But she's connected through them. You're going to be my, my eyes and ears. And therefore, I'm going to be right there with you. They don't, they don't fix the corruption. What does that mean? This ayat came after that story. She does not fix the corruption. What does that mean? She was lying up there when she said, I, was, I became a Muslim. I became a submitter. And you're going to see more detail. Remember, I asked you, why did she say, Aslam tu ma'a Sulaiman? Who, who says, Aslam tu ma'a? No one, nowhere in the Quran. You submit by yourself. You don't submit with somebody else. So that's a hint. And that made me think, okay, why Aslam to Ma'a Sulaiman? You continue the story, you continue the, the reading of the same surah, you find, ah, these are the nine people that she sent, Al Mursalun. I sent with them a gift. I'm going to send them with a gift. And you're going to see. Here's the gift. Quote, unquote, gift. قَالُوا تَقَاسَمُوا بِاللَّهِ لَنُبَيِّتَنَّهُ وَأَهْلَهُ ثُمَّ لَأَقُولَنَّ لِوَلِيِّهِ مَا شَهِدْنَا مَهْلِكَ أَهْلِهِ وَإِنَّا لَصَادِقُونَ They said, take an oath by Allah. They said among themselves, of course. They said, قَالُوا among themselves. تَقَاسَمُوا This is the evidence. Like the, 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 the form تَفَاعَلَ تَفَاعَلَ That means they're interacting with each other. تَقَاسَمُوا Take an oath among yourselves by Allah. That you will, that we shall inject, لَنُبَيِّتَنَّهُ inject criteria for erroneous understanding of his bait. Please pay attention, plural, buyut. So the bait, the bait is the collection of metaphorical uh, themes or more, it's one theme of metaphorical signals or symbols. We've talked about this many times before. So when we say al-ard, the scripture, and water coming down, al ma and السماء, and uh, خير, أنبتنا فيها, we, we cause to grow within it. All of these terms combine, combine to make one coherent collection, a theme. That's a bait. So why is it called a bait? Because in a family that has a bait, in a family that has a home, within that home, within that home, that group of people, refer to them as a family if you want, not ahl, refer to them as a family, they speak common terminology that is not necessarily understood by others. It's sort of in, inside, inside talk. Inside talk. I was talking to someone who had a fire, uh, who had a fire because of an air conditioner. And then later on, within that family, the word air conditioner, mukayyif in Arabic, became a symbol for cause of fire. 
So when they are about to leave the house, they, they remind each other, you know, be careful not to have an air conditioner on. They don't mean just a mukayif, just an air conditioner, any cause of fire. You know, check the gas, check the propane, check the electricity, all of that stuff. So that's an inside talk, inside speech. Every culture has that. Every home has that. So that's a bait. That's a reference to the bait. It's a theme, set of constructs, mental, metaphorical constructs that are summarized, symbolized by one or two words, an expression. So, who has the shadda on it. That means we create the criteria. As we saw, نفرقو. remember, لا نفرقو بين أحد منهم. نفرقو. we create the criteria. Here, we inject the criteria. Inject the criteria for erroneous understanding of his bait. Now you understand what the mission is. Mursilatun ilayhim. I'm sending to them a specific group with a mission. What's the mission? Spread misinformation. Watch. وَأَهْلَهُ And then his cohorts. Not just him, but his cohorts. Why? You're going to see. And then, and then, ثُمَّ لَنَقُولَنَّ لِوَلِيهِ And then we shall say to his wali. Well, what is wali? Uh, the sponsor. The sponsor. What does that mean? Well, every one of us has a sponsor who protects us. Well, what are they saying? They're saying, even if we become part of Ma Bainahuma, who come later, we have a thing to defend ourselves. Remember, remember uh, Jibreel requested from Sulaiman one of three things, or to bring, or to bring the third one, to bring authoritative evidence, proof of your innocence or of your seriousness. They're saying, we have such a authoritative proof. What is the authoritative proof? that we will say to his wali, to his wali, meaning the one who will be speaking on his behalf after we return as ma bainahuma. They're assuming, of course. They're assuming to be returning in the future as bainahuma instead of going directly to Jahannam. Okay, but that's, that's the theme. That's the understanding of what's going on. We shall create the wrong criteria for the buyut so that they get confused about the terminology him by himself? No, him and his cohorts. So they're going to work on the close companions. And then later on, thumma, later on, we will have an opportunity to defend ourselves by saying, we did not witness the destruction of his cohorts. His cohorts are those who learn from him and later. So they're saying, when we return later, we say, hey, we had nothing to do with all of these other generations successively learning the wrong things. We didn't have anything to do with all the other ones. We were only present for a few years we lived with them. So we're not the ones to be blamed for all the successive cohorts, generations and generations afterwards, who are supposed to be learning the way of Muhammad, but in reality are learning nubayyitannahu, learning what we nubayyitannahu, what we injected of the wrong criteria for the erroneous understanding of the terminology. What are they saying? They're saying this is our plot. Our plot is not just to work on Muhammad, Muhammad and his cohorts. And the damage, the true damage will only appear in the form of the destruction of his cohorts long after we are gone. Long after we are gone, we're not witnessing their destruction, but it will keep going and going and going. And when we are brought back in the form of Ma Bainahuma, we have an argument to present. We have an authoritative argument to say, hey, we did not witness any of the uh, of the events that led to all of these generations going wrong. And we are truthful. Yes, they are truthful in the sense that they're not going to be witnessing. What does that mean, witnessing? That means present physically. Remember, Hatta tashhadun until you witness. That's what she said to them. Hatta tashhadun. Now we understand what that means. So physically present with all of these successive generations who went wrong. I hope it's really clear. It is stunningly clear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And then, you know, we don't stop. We continue. Wa makaru makran wa makarna makran wa hum la yash'urun. And they were treacherous in a serious treachery. And we were treacherous in a serious treachery too. 
Who is we? Makarna, we. The angels, the malaika speaking. Who does that include? Musa, aka Jibreel, and later on, Sulaiman. We're going to see this. Makarna. Remember who's writing this? Who composed this? Innahu min Sulaiman. It's from Sulaiman. Sulaiman is saying this part of the speech in this kitab. Wahum la yashurun as the brothers or the siblings of Yusuf. You shall be later on telling them about this. And وَهُمْ لَا is a, is a marking for those types of people. فَانْظُرْ كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ مَكْرِهِمْ أَنَّا دَمَّرْنَاهُمْ وَقَوْمَهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ Observe then how was the aftermath of their treachery. Pay attention because this is the sad part starting to get through. فَانْظُرْ كَيْفَ كَانَ فَانْظُرْ Reflect how... The aftermath, the result of their treachery, that we destroyed them, the Marnahum, the people of Saba, and the nine people who came as agents, pretending to be Muslims, وَقَوْمَهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ and all of their community. Well, remember, they came pretending to be Muslims, and they stayed there to be preserving that lie. Because that was their mission. So who was their community? The people where they resided now. No longer part of the old community. They're part of the new community. Aqibat, the aftermath. The aftermath of their work. Where? In the new community. This is the dangerous part about this ayah. It, it makes your hair stand. Allah is telling us their community has been destroyed. Ajma'een, all of them, did they succeed or not? They did. To confirm, again, don't believe Dr. Haney, the next ayah, فَتِلْكَ بُيُوتُهُمْ خَاوِيَةً You're going to remember, فَانْظُرْ Observe, think, reflect. And there, there, tilka, in the far distance, and in the above statements of the woman, their buyut, remember, نُبَيِّتَنَّهُ Their buyut, which buyut? The buyut of Qawmahum. Later on, and they said, Ahlahu, Ahlahu, those who come later. Fatilka buyutuhum. These are their buyut. Khawiyah. They're hollow. Uh, I don't like this term. We're going to introduce a little bit more insightful translation to this term, but just for now, this is good enough. Due to how they transgressed. Bima dhalamu, dhalamu. This is the definition of the term dhalama. Indeed, in this is a sign to a com for a community of people who seek evidence-based knowledge. Seek evidence-based knowledge. That means those who were destroyed did not seek evidence-based knowledge. Who are the community who seek evidence-based knowledge? Who's the only person, only channel right now who says evidence-based knowledge from the Quran is the key, is the primary source? Who's the only one? preaching this message today exclusively the marvelous quran i don't care who wants to laugh i don't care who wants to mock us the quran is speaking on our behalf allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defends those who believe we present the evidence it's up to you to accept it's up to you to reject it's up to you to mock frankly we don't care we present the evidence based on what we see we are قومن, We are a community of people who seek evidence-based knowledge and we're proud to wear this label and to do the work that allow us to deserve this label. This is the definition of what we're talking about. We saved, we saved those who believed and, and, underline, underline and, and have been disciplined in engaging the scripture. People, قَوْمٍ يَعْلَمُونَ قَوْمٌ يَعْلَمُونَ We continue a little bit, and this is where the news continues with sad news. Already Muhammad sensed it through these ayat. Now we continue. Direct instruction to him. وَلَا تَحْزَنْ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا تَحْزَنْ عَلَيْهِمْ Don't be sad for them. For whom? What we saw. Who is he talking about? So whenever this ayah comes, وَلَا تَحْزَنْ عَلَيْهِمْ 
direct instruction to Muhammad, he's giving him bad news. Bad news about what? What does Muhammad care about? The people who read the Quran and should be on the right path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling him, don't be sad for them. And don't be in a, don't suffer tightness regarding the treachery of those nine people and the community behind them. Sabah. What does that tell you? They were infiltrating the, the community of believers. I'm not talking about munafiqun. I'm talking about a group of people who are much more serious, who eventually, eventually succeeded as we saw. This is a huge disclosure. This, is, this should be, you know, rocking every door in Al-Azhar University and, you know, Islamic University of this place or that place or the colleges, you know, whatever colleges you want to call. This revelation should be shaking their doors, should give them cold sweats, should prevent them from sleeping at night. Wake up. This is what the Quran is saying. Muhammad is instructed, don't be sad for them. Why? You're going to see the good news. And don't suffer tightness regarding their treachery. We saw this. All related, the same surah. This is ayah 70 of the same surah. Remember I told you, taliyati dhikran. The ayat that come after dhikr give you keys and clues. And they say, when shall this promise be? What promise? Ah, it's coming, now you see it. Now you understand the Quran is introducing a promise, the beginning of the good news. Just good news and the promise of the punishment or the destruction that we just saw. The destruction that we saw earlier, and these people are talking about the destruction. The destruction of the whole lineage and all of the cohorts cohorts around Muhammad at the time. And I told you, within 40 years, hardly anyone was left. And the new wave who succeeded in corrupting everything the early companions understood, took over and became the new wave that dominated the Islamic world for 1400 years, until now. Until maybe five, 10 years, 20 years ago, Allahu Alam, we know, you know, Allah will expose to us, inshallah. We are presenting the new terminology from the Quran, the original terminology of the Quran. So they're asking, when will this promise come if you are truthful? They're challenging, mocking, ah, promise, yeah, destruction. Well, where is this destruction come? Guess, guess what the Quran says. Asa an yakuna ready falakum ladi fi I hope to my Lord, this is a dua against them from Muhammad. Qul, some of what you rush to get has already been given to you. This confirms Muhammad understood the damage has started. Some of what you rush to get. Some. When did the rest happen? Last 1400 years. And your Lord, remember he said, don't be sad for them. Why? Because here's the answer. Your Lord provides benediction for people. What does that mean? Provide benediction. Direct divine guidance. Don't be sad for the masses who go astray. Allah can provide benediction directly, fadl directly to people. In this life, in this life, we talked about this. Fadl is about this life. Fawz is about the afterlife. Fadl, benediction. During this life, with the day's process. The problem is, they don't take to communicate with Allah. That's why in our dua, you know, we want to be communicating with Allah. How? Using the right terminology. Let's continue. And your Lord certainly can expose evidence-based knowledge about what their chests contain and what they declare. Why is that relevant? Because this is the fadl. This is the, the, the criterion for the fadl. If what you uh, hold inside your chest is truthful, is sincere, Allah knows this. From whom are you going to hide this? From Allah? So don't hope, don't hope to understand any of this unless Allah gives you the fadl, the benediction to understand it. That's why we have no problem disclosing as much as you want. 
Allah will not allow you to understand it. Allah will give you a million reasons to reject it. Why? Because Allah knows right here. Allah knows what's in your chest. So if you don't understand, ask yourself what's in your chest. Suffice it to say, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that everyone who's listening, because that's our true intention, is to bring people this new knowledge or this old knowledge revealed anew so that you connect directly with Allah with sincerity. Not to give you a better house, not to give you a better job, not to give you a, a, a wife if you're not married and so on and so forth. Forget all of these little petty things that, that you forget the minute you face death. Ask Allah to communicate with him in reverence to Allah, in sincerity. That's your main mission in life. I, I, I don't know how to say it in a, in a more clear way that these ayat are so beautiful and, and they give us a clearer path. So the Quran elaborates a little bit uh, in, in Surah Al-Anfal, Surah 8, Ayah 30. Again, confirming, Janah, confirming the same wings or the same concept provide, you know, are, are described in other wings. So I'm going to go through it quickly. This is from Surah 8. وَإِذْ يَمْكُرُوا بِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِيُثْبِتُوكَ أَوْ يَقْتُلُوكَ أَوْ يُخْرِجُوكَ وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُوا اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ and when the ones who rejected <coughs> act, yamkuru, now and in the future, yamkuru, present tense, with treachery, so that they give you steadiness with justification upon their ways. Yamkuru bika ladina kafaru, liyuth bituka. This is, they give you steadiness upon their ways, upon their ways. Not nuthabbitu, we're going to see it later. This is the justification from them. Or without justification. أو يقتلوك, or slay you. And we're going to see this is not the best translation, but this is fine for now. Or slay you. Or bring you out. Bring you out from where? Either from your town or from your community or from your understanding. All of those meanings are part of يخرجوك. وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ اللَّهُ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الْمَاكِرِينَ Does this remind us of any where we saw this? We just saw it in Surah and Naml 27. And they use treachery and Allah uses treachery too. And Allah provides the proper understanding of those who act with tre treachery. Meaning the proper understanding against them. Against them. Should be a better translation. Against. Sorry about that. I'm doing this live. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly telling us this is their aim. Their aim is to mislead you or to slay you or to bring you out from your current understanding. And then when our signs are recited upon them, they said, we heard you. Pay attention. This is exactly what we've been saying. When our signs are recited upon them, they say, we heard you as they did in Sabah. Had we willed, we would have said or we would say something like it. We would say something like it. This is but the writings of olden folks. Please pay attention. This is so critical. So those who make that argument, had we willed it, we would say something like it. We actually saw this in Surah An-Naml. And we actually saw that the people, the nine people aimed to do this. And they have the same mission that she articulated. Fasad. So that's what they wanted to do. What is their argument? What's their logic? for rejecting the, the credible belief that the terminology is critical. Why do they not seek the Abrahamic locution within the Quran? What do they say? They say the writings of old folks. What does that mean? That means the same stories existed in prior so-called scriptures. So anyone who brings us that argument, what did I teach you at the very beginning? Now you can see which is which, who is following whom. This is a clear signal of anyone who is victim to that woman. If they bring you stories from the Bible or claim the same stories in the Quran are the same as in the Bible, both types of Bible, guess what? Right there. Right there. That's their logic. And they will say, like it. 
had we willed, we would say the same or similar things, similar things. So this is part of the same group as we saw in YT171, YT170. But there is great hope and we're bringing the segment to a close. I promise you just a few minutes. وَإِذَا وَقَعَ الْقَوْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَخْرَجْنَا لَهُمْ دَابَّةً مِّنَ الْأَرْضِ تُكَلِّمُهُمْ أَنَّ النَّاسَ كَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا لَا يُوقِنُونَ I hope this guy with the funny hats can listen and learn and, and just I advise him to truly shut up and stop causing yourself to get into a deeper hole. You're too old to keep doing this. Stop. Dabbatan is not about this animal that comes out surprisingly from the earth and just silly imaginary, you know, kindergarten stuff. Stop. The Quran is not talking about this. The Quran is talking about the Dabba that we've talked about. We have a whole segment about Dabba, Dabba tul Ard, crawling on Ard one word at a time, slowly consuming the words and understanding the depth of what they mean engaging the Quran, people who engage the Quran. When the speech falls, meaning is fulfilled against them, meaning there's a period when that will happen. Remember Al-Wa'd, there's a promise. When the speech falls, is fulfilled against them, what will happen to them? Or what's, what's a sign? What's a sign that there's a new period, a new era of human awareness? We bring out for them a dabba, crawling on Ard, Engaging the Quran, talking to them exclusively from the Quran. I love this. This is together. This is together. I'm going to underline it. This is one clause. You don't separate it. Not dabbatan min al ard. Dabbatan min al ardi tukallimuhum. Together from the ard. This is this is using. Uh, historan protoran, if you remember, taqdim wa moving something ahead of something, because the exclusivity of al ard. So Allah subhanahu wa taala is telling us this dabba only exclusively speaks the Quran. That's it. That's the most important, the only important thing for them. What do they say? Beautiful that people have not treated our signs with certainty. With confidence. Yeah, they have done this. Every book of tafsir that brought us a story plagiarized or copied in their interpretation from the Bible are not yuqinun. Are not yuqinun. So we don't take from them. So that battle are us plainly, clearly are telling them you have not ha been having clear certainty and confidence in the word of Allah. You have not ascribed reverence to Allah and his words. We have nothing to apologize. The Quran is defending us. And I am proud, I'm grateful to Allah. I'm, I'm humbled that Allah selected every one of us to be speaking and to be in the audience right now because we're reading the ayat clearly. We're seeing them for the first time after 1400 years. I hope you have been enjoying this. Um, please don't put names on the chat. If I didn't say the name, I don't want to say the name. So I want to remind you of the special dua. I'm going to repeat it one more time. This is the ayah, and this is how we did the toiling, and this is how we extracted the dua, crafted the fulk that help us through the sea of confusion. I'm leaving it on the screen so you guys can take a screenshot and learn it. رَبِّ ثَبِّتْنِي بِالْقَوْلِ الثَّابِتِ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ وَجَنِّبْنِي ضَلَالَ الظَّالِمِينَ This is the first dua. And the second dua. رَبَّنَا افْتَحْ لَنَا أَبْوَابَ السَّمَوَاتِ بِمَاءٍ مُنْهَمِرْ وَفَجِّرْ لَنَا الْأَرْضَ عُيُونًا وَجْعَلْنَا مِمَّنْ شَكَرْ I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept from us. I'm going to take a few questions and inshallah we're going to wrap it up. So let me uh, stop the sharing. I think we're done here. There's a conclusion. This was a partial installment of the story of Suleiman and the woman. Partial, very small bit. We saw the mauj. We saw the complexity and the sophistication and the full awareness it requires uh, to understand what's going on. Yes, it is scary. Yes, it is dangerous. 
but we are stronger with the support of Allah. As I showed you, we know how to craft the dua and Allah will respond. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ اُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Your Lord said, invite me or supplicate to me, I shall respond to you. This is a promise from Allah. We take it, we take it done, done deal. It's happened already. So why isn't it happening for 1400 years for the Muslims all over the world? Someone tell me, please, why? Write me in the comment. Why are the Muslims almost 2 billion making dua and our conditions are almost the worst in the world? Where is the promise of Allah? Allah's promise is truthful. Allah's promise is truthful. We have not fulfilled our part. Wad'uni, using his asma, the labels that are insightful from his book, from his scripture. Walillahi al-asma'ul husna fad'uhu biha. And all of us are trying to make dua, but we don't get results. What does that mean? Allah is, is lying? Astaghfirullah. No, you are not following the instructions. Just like if someone didn't follow the instructions at the beginning of this video and start putting comments, you know, you know he did not listen. He did not even pay attention to the instructions. So majority of Muslims did not pay attention. Yeah, it's possible. And you saw the evidence from Surat and an naml And Muhammad was told, don't feel sad for them. Them, all of them, all of them. Qawmahum ajma'een, all of them. No one left. Allah told us, and Jaina Ladina Amen. What can we attakun? We saved those who, who believed and were disciplined. So we're not making any of this up. The Quran is very clear. Just submit. Just accept that the Quran is really good for us. That's all we're trying to tell you. So I hope you take it to heart. I promise you, you need to listen to this again and again because it's scary, it's dangerous. But we are stronger with the support of Allah. There's a lot more upcoming in the future segments. So stay tuned. And one more time, I apologize for <laughs> being late, but I think we're done. So let me see a few questions in here. I'm going to start from the top. Uh, yeah, I know we have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of questions that uh, I need to terminate the sharing in here so you guys can see my face. And we go back to this. All right. So let's see the questions. Um, I know in the beginning, there were a lot of questions that were sort of based on incomplete information. So I'm going to skip over them. Uh, okay. Erwin Sado, could you elaborate a little on how the word, the word Tastalun, I've explained it before. Tastalun has a ta in the middle, which is a replacement for the letter ta. So it's supposed to be Tasta. Loon, take out the ta, it becomes salawa, that's the root, which is the same root for salat. We've explained it. So, um, alhamdulillah, another gift. Alhamdulillah, you are all gifts to me. I'm, I'm so blessed. I'm so grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for having a beautiful, uh, beautiful ahl. And I mean it in full sincerity. Uh, some of the people I've met have become more dear to me than some of my own blood family members. So I don't take this lightly. I take it as a responsibility. That's why I do my best. And that's why I'm afraid to be saying the wrong things. As I said at the beginning of the segment, I've never been so afraid. But alhamdulillah, I think we're, we're doing the right thing and we're going in the right direction. Uh, let's see. Why is this evil woman still in Bainahuma? I did not say that. Uh, you did not hear me say, I said, maybe, maybe. I keep saying maybe. So be patient. We're going to talk more about Ma Bainahuma and Al-Ghabirin. Is she just by herself or her followers became her lineage, quote, quote, lineage? And they're multiplying and reproducing and continuing. Possible. As I said last time, we are facing a tsunami, tsunami of evil corruptors of understanding, not of the Quran. Alhamdulillah, the Quran is safe. They don't even dare think about corrupting the Quran directly. But corrupting the understanding, this is where they worked on. And they used all sorts of tricks and tactics. And we saw some of their strategy today. Did Sulaiman also use Raja'aya? I explained this and I explained why, because that was part of... <clears throat> 
uh, the plot that's being set uh, for that woman. Uh, Brother Shahza comment for 2732, the first interpretation, non-highlighted. You are pretending how the traditional interpretation. Yeah, of course, I'm giving you the traditional base interpretation and then diving into the interpretation based on the Abrahamic locution. That was the part that we highlighted. Uh, Brother uh, Dil Kausain, why Allah is allowing all this to happen in such a complex way? It's not. It's not really complex if you start appreciating that um, that this is real. This is real life. This is real life. Even in the animal world, there are birds that fake other animals, that speak like other animals. They They fake their sound and their speech, yes? So all creatures... All creatures suffer this problem. Human beings, yes, they suffer this problem. Are you are you helped and benefited by knowing <laughs> that this is happening? Of course you are. Are you going to be smarter by paying attention closer now to every word, every part of the locution? You may think it's difficult because you know you were not trained in Arabic or you were deprived in your youth of learning Arabic. But that's not the problem of the Quran. The Quran is showing you this happens in every language. What do we do to learn the proper terminology? As I said last time, don't shoot the messenger. Go back. You still have time in your life. Allah will provide you additional opportunities, not just in this life, but in the afterlife. Uh, brother, be patient. You said salat is done to you. You don't do salat. But how does that work with Ayah 9, 103? Take from their wealth, sadaqah, and salah upon them. Uh, indeed, your salat is a sakina upon them. Again, I introduce the topic and I give you hints. I'm never, you're never going to find me. Please listen to me carefully. You're never going to hear me say, do this and don't do that. Regarding salat or siyam, who am I? Who am I to tell you how to connect to your Lord? or what acts of devotion you should seek to connect with your Lord. Who am I? If I told you, I would be acting as mindun, intermediary. So you will never find me telling you, don't do this way of prayer, or don't do this way of, of uh, fasting. Those are acts of devotion between you and Allah. Why should I have anything, anything to say about it? So please understand, don't put me on the spot and expect me or, or blame me for not telling you. I'm never going to tell you. You have to make up your own mind. I may give you different opinions. I may give you different hints. But guess what? This is your job. Your job is to seek your own ways for acts of devotion. Salat included. Salat included. I'm sorry, but this is, this is me. I'm not going to take the blame for you in the afterlife or... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causing me to be held responsible for wrong things you thought I said. So to be very clear, you're not going to hear me tell anyone, don't do it that way, that way, do it this way. You're never going to hear me say that. Whoever tells you this is misleading you and doesn't understand that they're sub, sub, subjecting themselves to a grave danger of becoming mindun. They're, they're silly minded, they're stupid. I'm sorry, they're stupid. Who, 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 why do you want to put yourself in that position and tell them salat is to be done this way or that way? Why? Give the ideas, allow people to make up their own mind. This is what the Quran is all about. Um, <clears throat> let's see, there are some people talking about the power of women. And yeah, I know, I know. So, Sister AI, is it teaching us or preparing us for the afterlife? Yes, of course. All of this stuff. Let's continue. A couple more questions. Are there good women besides Maryam and Imra uh, Fir'aun mentioned? Good question. But I think those are giants. I mean, those are wonderful human beings. And um, if we, frankly, if we only had these two women and no other men, the Quran would be beautiful on its own. So we haven't talked much about Imrat Faraon, but inshallah, when we talk about her, you're going to be like in love with this woman. Ishtiaq Miraj, if she is like this, then why isn't she in Hijr? Uh, good question. 
inshallah when we deal with ma bainahuma and some of the details we will uh, we will get into that uh, so abdul nasir uh, was dadu tis'an yes absolutely i gave you the hint when we talked about the companions of the cave ahl al kahf that there are nine who are mentioned somewhere else in the quran now you understand and now you understand why ashab al kahf companions of the cave are not good people and that's what I said in that segment. <gasps> they're not good people. No, they're not good people. Go back to that segment where I talk about the companions of the cave, Ahl Ashab al Kahf. And that shows you how little, how little informed those who wrote the books of Tafsir really are. I'm sorry, but this is the truth. You know, I, I'm not bad mouthing an individual because I don't even believe that those who wrote those books put the right names on those books. So the names versus the books are two different people. Whoever wrote those books and delivered them to us is not the same as the people whose names are on those books. So I'm not bad-mouthing a specific individual. We don't have the originals of any of those books. So yeah, I'm not bad-mouthing any single individual. I'm saying whoever wrote these books did not mean well for us. In most cases, I'm not saying everything in them is bad, of course. Uh, so that's why the previous generations were very smart. They understood the model and plotted. Um, I don't know if the word smart is what I would use, but thank you. Yeah, I think I think uh, you're on the right track. Uh, please uh, don't forget to leave comments and please don't forget to like and uh, subscribe if you have not done so. If you have not subscribed to our website, please take care of that as soon as possible so you get the benefit. I showed you a taste of the dua that uh, your brothers and sisters are enjoy enjoying on a regular basis day daily. And um, hopefully we can continue with this with this story. Sorry, I'm, I'm getting very hungry in here. <laughs> I haven't had anything. So we will continue with this series and this story um, in future segments. And next week we have another YouTube live and we will continue, inshallah. Hopefully we will see you. Make the dua with me. Please don't forget these two dua I shared with you, special for this session. Go back and memorize them. Let's make the dua as we close. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi alladhi hadana lihada. Wa ma kunna linahtadiya lawla an hadana Allah. Laqad jaat rusulu rabbina bil haq. I thank you very much for watching. And inshallah we will see you all uh, next week inshallah.